earlier, which is um, where we, we were selected and we were able to go on to this round where we finalize the design and present that to NASA. Good evening, this is Brass Tax. I'm Zaka Jacob. The governors of a dozen states were changed by the Modi government, but one in particular has been the subject of a big political attack. Retired Supreme Court Judge S. Abdul Nazir was appointed governor of Andhra Pradesh, but the opposition has taken exception to it, saying that he's being rewarded for being part of the Ram Janbhumi judgment bench. Justice Nazir has been part of many benches and judgments, and in many cases, he's also been the dissenting judge. Why is the opposition overlooking his competence to occupy high constitutional office like that of the governor? Or should the government have taken heed and given off a cooling off period of at least six months before appointing a judge as governor? Or are these post-retirement posts now being a lure for members of the Supreme Court? But first, the story. have served uh, in the apex judiciary, should they be accepting uh, such post-retirement sinecures? Congress party itself had laid down the convention of giving positions to the retired judges, some allegations on such appointment. I think it is not proper on the part of any political party. So a governor is appointed or dismissed by the President of India and since the President acts on the aid and advice of the Prime Minister and the Council of Ministers, in effect, the governor is appointed and removed by the central government. There are certain conditions laid down in Articles 157 and 158 to appoint a president. They have to be citizens of India. They should be at least 35 years of age. They cannot be members of parliament or any state legislature. And they must not hold any other office of profit at the time of appointment as governor. Now, just as Nazir's appointment as governor of Andhra Pradesh is not the first such instance. In fact, it is the fourth such case in the history of independent India. He was appointed as governor of Andhra Pradesh about a month or so after he retired as a Supreme Court judge. Back in 2014, Justice Sadasivam was appointed as governor of the state of Kerala just months after he had retired as the Chief Justice of India. Justice Fatima Bivi, way back in the 90s, was made governor of the state of Tamil Nadu by the H.D. Deve Gowda government. This was back in 1997. This was five years after her retirement from the Supreme Court. And Justice Syed Fazal Ali was made governor of Odisha a month after he retired as the Supreme Court judge in 1952 and later as Assam governor when Jawaharlal Nehru was prime minister. Then there is, of course, the case of Justice Hidayatullah, who served as the acting president while he was still the chief justice of India. The first time happened to be in 1969 when then-President Zakir Hussain passed away while he was in office. Then-Vice-President V.V. Giri assumed the president's office as acting president, but in order to contest for the 1969 presidential elections, V.V. Giri had to resign from both positions, and Justice Hidayatullah was elevated as president. Then again, in 1982, when President Zail Singh travelled to the United States for a heart surgery, Justice Hidayatullah once again served as acting president of India for a few weeks. Now, Justice Nazir was elevated to the Karnataka High Court bench at a very early age of 45. He spent 14 years at the High Court before his appointment as a Supreme Court judge on the proposal of a collegium that was led by then Chief Justice of India, J.S. Kher. This was back in 2017. Justice Nazir was not even a Chief Justice at a High Court when he was elevated to the Apex Court. He was the fourth senior most amongst the judges of the High Courts at that point of time. 
He went on to be part of several momentous judgments delivered by the Supreme Court. He was, of course, part of the bench on the Ayodhya Babri Masjid dispute case, which delivered a unanimous verdict on allowing construction of Ram Mandir at the disputed site. He led the Constitution bench on demonetization, which upheld the note ban decision as valid. He was also part of the bench which ruled in the KS Putaswami case, this is the famous Aadhaar case, it held that right to privacy was a fundamental right. He also led the constitution bench which held that additional restrictions not found in Article 19.2 cannot be imposed on the right to free speech of ministers or legislators. There are also notable judgments in which Justice Nazir was a dissenting voice, like when the Supreme Court brought down the curtains on the thousand-year-old practice of triple talaq amongst Muslims. Along with the then CGI Justice Geher, Justice Nazir had noted that talaq e bidat is a matter of personal law of Sunni Muslims, and that being a component of personal law, it has protection under Article 25 of the Constitution. He also noted that triple talaq among Muslims was an integral part of their religion and faith, and it cannot be dismissed as unconstitutional. At the most, he said in his judgment, that it can be called gender discriminatory practice that can be done away by way of legislation. Before he agreed with the unanimous verdict of the Ayodhya bench, he had earlier dissented against the majority view that refused to refer the issue to a larger bench. In September of 2018, a three-judge Supreme Court bench, in a majority opinion 2-1, declined to refer the question if a mosque as a place of prayer is an essential part of Islam. Justice Nazir observed that the question of what is essential or not essential in a religion cannot be decided hastily. He held that the question raised on the essentiality of offering prayers in mosques should be examined by a seven-judge bench before the Ayodhya suit appeals are heard. So let's take a look at where the five judges who are part of that historic bench which delivered the verdict in the Ayodhya Ramjan Mumi case, where are they today? Justice Ashok Bhushan, he retired as a Supreme Court judge in, May of, uh, in July of 2021. Four months later, in November, he was appointed as the chairperson of the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. Justice Sharad Aravind Bobde retired as Chief Justice of India in 2021. He has not held any public office after retiring. Justice Ranjan Gogoi, who was uh, the head of that bench, he retired as the Chief Justice in November of 2019. Four months later, he was nominated by the President and appointed as a member of the Rajya Sabha. Justice D.Y. Chandra Chud, who is the current Chief Justice of India, he'll be in office till November 2024. And finally, fifth on that uh, five-judge bench was Justice Nazir, who's now been appointed as the Governor of Andhra Pradesh. Now, the opposition is, in up, is up in arms, alleging a quid pro quo between the centre and judges, taking the case of uh, Justice Nazir. If you recall, a former Chief Justice of India was also appointed as the Governor of a state. Uh, similarly, uh, there have been from time to time, concerns which have been articulated, some of them which you referred to uh, with regard to what late Mr. Arun Jaitley had said, whether people who have served uh, in the apex judiciary, should they be accepting uh, such post-retirement sinecures? It is a serious question which needs to be debated. Gogai Saab ko bhi Rajya Sabha ka sadhasya bada hai. Juno ne Ayodhya, sorry. अयोध्या के मसले पर निर्णय दिया था अब बुरी बात यह लगती है कि वो न्याय था या फेवरिज्म था ऐसा नहीं सोचना चाहिए ना ये सोच आएगी क्योंकि आप बदले में कुछ दे रहे हैं इन लोगों को जिन्होंने आपके बारे में फेवर किया उनको कुछ ना कुछ फेवर आप कर रहे हो न्याय व्यवस्था पर लांछन नहीं है here are some instances now when the Congress was in power, it had given governmental or constitutional post to judges immediately after retirement. Justice K.G. Balakrishnan was appointed as the chairperson of the National Human Rights Commission barely a month after he retired. Justice A.K. Ganguly was appointed head of West Bengal's Human Rights Panel. This was in March 2012, again a month or so after retiring. Justice M. Sharma was cleared as the chief of a Vansadhara Water Dispute Tribunal just four months before he retired. Justice Ellis Panta was appointed as chairperson of the National Green Tribunal after retiring as a Supreme Court judge. So let me now open this up to our guests who are joining us. Nalan Kohli, BJP spokesperson joining us. Ghansham Tiwari, spokesperson of the Samajwadi Party. Sanjay Jha, former leader of the Congress Party. And Aman Lekhi is former ASG and senior advocate. Uh, Nalan Kohli, what the opposition is saying is this is some kind of a quid pro quo that judges 
uh, being given post-retirement posts like that of governor uh, should not be encouraged. They're even quoting the late Arun Jaitley who said in parliament, the judges are now keeping a keen eye on these post-retirement sinecures. We should thank at least the Congress uh, and the opposition to find at least some intellectual bandwidth within the BJP and its former leader, Mr. Arun Jaitley, since they themselves seem to be battling political uh, bankruptcy in terms of ideas. What they are saying is ridiculous, must be condemned, is absolutely inaccurate. The first such appointment, as you pointed out, was Justice Fazal Ali by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in 1952, one month after his appointment. So was that some pro pro quo? Absolutely not. Number two is that uh, this argument that's being taken about, uh, you know, this is a reward is also a weak argument, a specious argument for three reasons. This is an argument because the Congress party and the opposition tends to blame even the election commission for being in the pocket of the BJP. But when they win elections, they find them to be fair. The same they seem to be doing with judgments. Every time they like a judgment, then the judiciary is impartial. Every time they don't like our judgment for political reasons, not for judicial reasons, then they tend to look at it as if the judiciary is not uh, impartial. So these arguments of convenience have to have a line. And I think this line is being breached again and again by the Congress and other parties. Okay. And they need to reflect on what they are saying before they make these attacks in a blatant manner. Two things to bring up before I close my this argument is that certain positions are not rewards. They require a former Supreme Court judge to be appointed as the person heading that tribunal. For example, you mentioned about the National Green uh, Tribunal, the NGT. Yeah. Now, I mean, in that case, it's normally a Supreme Court judge who goes there. So therefore, I think to be treating that as a reward or by someone making such an argument is incorrect. So I think uh, to right. close this, I would feel that Justice Nazir, who's been appointed as governor, is holding another constitutional position. He took the oath of the constitution as every judge in a constitutional court, yeah, he'll be taking the oath of the constitution as governor. Yeah, it's not and a as an expert uh, on the constitution, as an, as an interpreter and of I the constitution, great, and right, uh, as good, a judge, he, he is best placed to be, or at least fit to be in a constitutional office. Uh, let, let, me, let me ask uh, uh, Gansham Tiwari this. The question of precedent, I outlined this in 2014, Justice Sadasivam, after being the CGI within uh, six, six months of his retirement, he was appointed as governor of uh, Kerala. Justice Fatima Bibi, when the H.D. Devagada government was uh, ruling in the, in the center, Fatima Bibi, the first woman judge of the Supreme Court, uh, she was appointed as governor of Tamil Nadu. Justice Syed Fazal Ali uh, was made governor of Odisha a month after he retired, uh, and then again governor of Assam. All of this while Jawaharlal Nehru was prime minister. So there is precedent. So why are you going after the BJP and uh, the case of Justice Nazir being appointed as governor of Andhra Pradesh when the Congress, while it was in power and other parties while they were in power, have done exactly the same thing. Good evening, Zaka, to you, the view. All right, I think, I can't hear. I think we've lost Gansham Tiwari's uh, audio. We'll try and fix that in a moment. Uh, Sanjay Jha, you want to take that? Uh, Zaka, first and foremost, I think it's important to set the context for this conversation. It's a very serious debate, in my opinion. Number one, you are living in times when this government is openly threatening the Supreme Court of India on the basic structure of the Constitution itself. So the first point I want to highlight here is that while we are talking about, you know, the flagrant, uh, you know, violation of constitutional protocols, let us accept the reality that the BJP is going hammer and tongs at the very fundamental nature of the Indian Constitution and is taking on the Supreme Court. Number two, it's been unprecedented when, when Mr. Modi has been the Prime Minister, you have had the, the, uh, the very embarrassing spectacle of four judges of the Supreme Court publicly stating that India's democracy is in danger and implicitly implying that even the Supreme Court of India, the, the august, uh, you know, shall we say, epicenter of justice being compromised as far as benches were concerned. I mean, this is really political immorality or judicial intervention happening at, at an abysmal level. Now, let me answer this question. I do believe that if there is a judge who is competent, you know, they may be given roles, but there should be a cooling off period. You know, that, that's a first consideration. Okay. Because, you know, if you look at if you look at Mr. Gagoy's uh, judgments, within months he's accommodated in the in the Raj Sabha. 
you mentioned another chief justice of india who we all know gave a verdict in the amit shah you know fake encounter case and he was immediately uh, given the job of a governor in, in the state of kerala now these are sending wrong signals to ordinary citizens of india because who do the people really turn to the, the executive and the politicians fail you the only hope the people of india have it is is the courts okay. and if the supreme court gets questioned we we are in deep trouble okay so let me ask gansham tiwari i think his line has been patched back now gansham tiwari on the question of precedent when the opposition says oh this is unprecedented that's not quite the case from fazal ali to fatima bivi to sadasivam this has happened in the past so why is uh, justice nazir being singled out good evening zaka to you the viewers and fellow co panelists if we let bjp get away with with murderous attempts on our democracy on uh, by the fake uh, logic of precedents then every future rapist has a fake uh, has a precedents in bilkis bano case and and uh, will be emboldened bjp has no place to hide when it it hides behind precedents because it, it the, the party will look at every wrong doing in the past or every every exception in the past and use it to subvert democracy whether it is fighting uh, the current uh, uh, judicial system uh, which was taken head on by the uh, vice president in his maiden speech in in the parliament whether it is uh, uh, communicating that uh, while in gujarat model one could get away with murder as was public perception now the public perception perception will be you can get away with judgment here is the example in the beginning of this program you read out the judgments of justice nazir yeah he has a 20 year old uh, judicial record maybe more and now because of bjp because of their uh, design to to subvert democracy uh, his 20 year old, uh, old career will be looked from the prism of whether this is favoritism or not and this is what bjp wants to achieve that if you are in the court you will fight the government and the government will take you on from every aspect whether it is appointment of judges or your your uh, your own stature as a judge and if you are if you are retiring then the government will will create a situation where entire your entire career will be suspect but, but and uh, gansham gansham who is looking at these judges from prism of just one judgment isn't the opposition looking at him just from the prism of the ram janmabhoomi judgment every, like i said every, he was the dissenting judge in the triple talaq matter if you look at the press today and the discussion on this everyone is looking at his entire career and looking at this as a conclusive move in his career this is exactly what happened to ranjan gogoi every such appointment uh, justice mishra you look at every uh, appointment of a supreme court judge that this bjp makes the first of all the role of governor in bjp mr koshiari was let go he he has the brazen and uh, infamy of getting up at 5:30 am to give mr fadnavis a oath in a, a which was uh, completely okay. against the spirit of constitution anyway so, that's so that, that's where deviating governor from the topic is, is, topic okay already in hmm. a bjp is instrument today to subvert democracy so, so let, and now judiciary will be another instrument let let me ask um, aman lekhi you know whether it is the human rights commission or national green tribunal as uh, nalin also outlined a moment ago those are you know the requirements are that it be headed by a former judge but when it comes to uh the post of governor do you reckon that there should be a a cooling off period or b that judges should not you know this this carrot of a post retirement uh, uh benefit or a post retirement office should not be dangled before judges because that could potentially uh influence them at least the people who are on the benches right now they they could uh, the famous arun jetli quote from parliament was also about that the judges are now thinking about post retirement perks and office Uh, well i feel a good judge has done this service to himself um, this is a facet of what i would call a revolving door policy in politics and reciprocal privileges which uh, need to be avoided because they seem to give the suggestion that judgments are political capital now i don't join uh, the comments uh, of some political parties which seem to undermine uh, the judgments rendered by the supreme court to suggest that they are any less valid because uh justice nazir has been made governor i think that's sheer politics and courts doesn't courts don't decide matters on these basis this is purely some uh, petty talk which is which is there so i don't subscribe to that that said i feel perception is important and uh, if by reason of this appointment there is an option for a person to think that what is suspected is true then that affects the institutional credibility and the judge in question should have actually thought it out before accepting this this particular appointment 
uh, you have mentioned instances of the past and call them precedent. What in constitutional law we deal is not precedent but convention. And when you deal with convention, you don't count the number of times something has happened in the past. What you see is whether there is worth in what has happened okay. and whether what has happened is right. And ironically, uh, this is what no one is talking about, Justice Nazir himself is a co-author of a judgment which deals with what conventions are and adopts Iva Jennings concept of what conventions are dealing with three facets. One, that it has happened. Two, when it has happened, it is believed it should have happened. And three, it should not have instrumental but a normative basis. So, mainly because there have been eight instances in the past of judges being appointed governor, that doesn't necessarily justify a ninth instance okay. unless the appointment is justified. And here the question comes of political morality. And why I say, I mean, people talk about provision of the constitution, say there is no bar. Because there is no bar, it doesn't necessarily mean that the absence of the bar permits any action. Mm -hmm. Because in the gap or in the absence is the requirement of restraint. And restraint is absolutely imperative for constitutional ethics. Okay. This is a question of constitutional ethics. And because the question of constitutional ethics, the enforcer is not law. The enforcer is conscience. So it depends upon the person, mainly because there is a permissive uh, possibility by reason of want of restraint doesn't necessarily mean that if an avenue is opened, okay. that option is taken. Okay, so because in so far as the judge is concerned. Yeah. L let me ask Nalan Kohli that, that just because there are precedents doesn't mean that uh, uh, it needs to be uh, 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 followed. And B, uh, in this case, it's more convention and less precedent. Uh, and, and how would you respond to Amal Lekhi's point about uh, this lacks constitutional ethics or political morality, as he put it, because a good judge gets tainted by way of this decision and his acceptance of the same. I think, first of all, I'm not going to join uh, into a debate with my good friend, uh, Avan Lekhi, uh, whom I personally respect and like a lot. Uh, but because you see, there are two different debates happening at the same time. One is a political debate in which my other colleagues are sitting. And therefore, I am going to aggressively attack those points. The second is at a different level, an intellectual level, which is what Aman Bai is taking the debate towards. But let me come back to two or three points that came up before he spoke. Um, I found it a little bit funny also that while they were, Mr. Jha, Sanjay was raising the argument of democracy being in danger when Supreme Court judges went out in a press conference, one of those the people was in that press conference was Mr. Justice Chief Justice eventually, Ranjan Gogoi, who now is a Rajya Sabha member and they use the same argument about democracy being in danger against him. Now, having a point of view doesn't change anything. I think everyone, including Mr. Jha and the others, or even Kansham, they're raising a point of view. Democracy permits us to have even strong points of view. And I don't see any harm in that. But what I'm taking exception to are three things. A is the politics of convenience where the Congress party and the opposition parties, when something suits them, they immediately raise the institution or the person to the altar of magnificence. That this is how it should function. The minute they don't like something, the same person or institution is dropped to the navi or to the depths of, you know, attack. That this is an institution okay. that has lost its credibility and we are unhappy. And that's why I gave the example of the election commission. That they have run down the election commission, election commissioners on a number of occasions. But then every time they win an election, the election commission is good. So I think the problem is not with the election commission, but with the fact that they need to get votes. And votes come from the electors, people, voters, citizens. The same is the argument here. On a given day, a judge will look at 50, 60 cases on a, on a you know, non-miscellaneous day, probably 15. But that judgment will finally be in favor or against someone. You can't build a case against judges or the institution based on the fact that judgment that you like or you believe, yes, this is how it should have been, okay. happens so the judge is good. And judgments that didn't go your way, at the end of the day, you say the judge is wrong. The Ayodhya case had to be decided. It had to be decided one day. 
the Congress party prevented that decision from happening on every occasion. Finally, when it was to be decided, someone would have sat on the bench and someone would have ruled on it. That bench happened to include five people and they decided unanimously the same people have differed against the government on different occasions. So what is this? How do you then create a judgment against a judge like Justice so, Mazi today in this case, saying that today he seems biased or there's a question of so, morality on him, but when he ruled against the government or he ruled on something strongly, then he seemed very so, good. So can so I ask Sanjay Jha that by, by, by picking just one judgment, aren't you doing a disservice to the judge? I mean, he was, like I said, the dissenting judge in the triple talaq verdict. Uh, he also was the one who said that the matter of whether a, a mosque is an essential Pra or, or worshipping in a mosque is an essential practice of Islam, whether uh, having a mosque is fundamental to Islam. He was the one who said, again, he was a dissenting judge, he wanted to refer it uh, to a larger bench. Uh, in the, uh, he, was the, he was part of the Putuswami judgment wh which upheld privacy as a fundamental right. So when there are judgments that, as Nalan Kohli said, judgments you like, he's a good judge, but judgments that you don't like, he's a bad judge. Uh, Zaka, I don't want to get into the merit and demerit of various judgments he's made. I quite agree with you that many of them I personally agree with. But here is the fundamental point. Let me tell you what Mr. Lakey said becomes very germane. The issue of perception, in my opinion. The, let, let's bite the bullet here. Today, you and I, all of us on the panel know, I think even the viewers do, that all the gubernatorial uh, 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 appointments that are done are eventually nothing but political puppets at the end of the day. Look at the governors under this government in particular. You can also say it happened under the Congress time. The governors basically function as the puppet of the center. Now, here you have a situation where a Supreme Court judge is taking over the role of the governor. Don't blame the ordinary public citizen for believing that this is going to be a compromised situation. Okay. I mean, that's the hard political reality we need to accept. The second point that Nalid cannot dodge out of, he can't be so disingenuous with due respects, that India is seeing an institutional emasculation happening at the moment. To give you just one example in which the courts have said, so many arrests have been made, where the courts have said the ED actually doesn't even have a case. So you are finding today a situation where there are human rights violations, and the courts are telling the government how to behave in terms of hate speech, and the government is telling the Supreme Court that the basic structure has got to be challenged, and we are not even getting into the extremely complicated okay. debate about the appointment of judges. So, so we are at the moment in an ocean of deep trouble. So, so let me ask Gansham Tiwari and then give the final word to Aman Lekhi after that. Uh, when it comes to, again, constitutional uh, offices which require the services of a judge, whether it was UPA or NDA, which was in power, they've all appointed. K.G. Balakrishnan was appointed chairperson of the NHRC just a few months after he uh, retired. So was Justice Ganguly of the State Human Rights Commission in Bengal. Uh, there, there was the instance of uh, a number of judges being appointed as the head of the NGT and so on. So a governor's office where you will have to interpret matters of the Constitution, the governor, of course, uh, is faced with delicate uh, situations where the Constitution has to be interpreted. Who better qualified than... Uh, somebody who has done that uh, as his profession, as a judge, for the last, uh, what is it, almost 10 years now? Since 2014, he was elevated uh, as a judge. From Ladakh to Delhi, to uh, Kerala, to Maharashtra, to Karnataka, to Goa, is there a governor office that BJP has, has really used to, to uh, showcase the strength of constitution and federal structure? To Puducherry, to Tamil Nadu, is there a single government office? No. The BJP has used the government uh, go governor's office to challenge the elected mandate of, a, uh, of uh, the chief minister. Uh, chief Minister Mamata Banerjee was heckled in presence of the prime minister by hooligans of BJP at a constitutional ceremony. So clearly to say that uh, Justice Nazir is, uh, is appointed there to uphold the sanctity or constitutional sanctity of, of governor office, office is, I think, uh, injustice to BJP which has uh, currently uh, used every governor office for its political benefits and uh, mocking the constitution. Okay. I think the reality no, is the, BJP the, is sending a clear message. The fact is that governors were political BJP appointees even in the past, but be that as it may, I, I, I really have limited time, so I'm going to give Aman Lekhi the final word. You know, whether it is constitutional ethics that you talked about in the previous answer or political morality, uh, like I said, there is no illegality in this appointment. There is, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, the, why should, why should this take away from the track record of a good judge, as you, as you called him? 
No, absolutely. The question is not of illegality, the question is propriety. And propriety is as important a part of the legal process as the legality. Because in perception, as I pointed out, the worth of law remains. And particularly when you hold high offices and offices in the Supreme Court, some kind of austere approach, a bit Spartan approach, a bit of restraint is mandated. Uh, you have to withdraw from such places, not in fact get invited to them. And I personally feel Justice Nazir was an exceptionally good judge. As I said at the beginning, he could have, I could have uh, avoided this particular option and uh, actually vindicated his position and in some way reinforced the values that the Supreme Court stands for. Uh, right. But that did not happen. And that's because I feel that as far as uh, the individuals are concerned, it's you and I may talk, but until the choice, a right choice is exercised by the person to whom an offer is made, uh, all our conversation is going to be futile. The test eventually depends upon the person himself. All right. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Narun Kohli, Gansham Tiwari, Sanjay Jha and Aman Leakey for joining us. Uh, we'll see how this story plays out politically, whether the opposition will continue to make this a bit of a sticking point. Meanwhile, uh, the Chief Minister of the State, uh, Jagan Mohan Reddy, has welcomed and said that he look, looks forward to working with uh, our Governor Nazir, uh, as, is to, as in, in this case. Uh, let's move on to the other story that we're tracking, the biennial Aero Show. Aero India kicked off in Bangalore this year. It's supposed to be the biggest contingent of aircraft and manufacturers as well as defense companies. There is a strong element of make in India. The attendees are from over 90 countries and deals worth 75,000 crores are expected to be signed. The theme of this year's Aero India is the runway to a billion opportunities. Over the next four days, Asia's biggest air show will showcase India's growth in aerospace and defense capabilities. The focus of the event is to showcase indigenous equipment and technologies, as well as forging partnerships with foreign companies. This will be in line with the Make in India, Make for the World vision that's been outlined by the Modi government. Nay, Bharat ke samarth ka sakshi ban raha hai. बेंगलुरु का आसमान आज इस बात की गवाही दे रहा है कि नई ऊंचाई नए भारत की सच्चाई है आज देश नई ऊंचाइयों को छू भी रहा है और उन्हें पार भी कर रहा है the highlight of day one was some breathtaking aerobatics and mid-air maneuvering. A plethora of aircraft of the Indian Air Force displayed their aerial prowess the at the event, including the Sukhoi 30 MKIs, which dazzled the crowds with this famous loop-tumble-yaw movement. The light combat aircraft, the uh, Tejas, the LCA, that was the highlight of this year. Uh, and on day one, it took off from the Alanka Air Base, performing maneuvers like the hesitation roll and a vertical pinchback. The Indian Air Force's light combat helicopter, the LCH, has also performed during the inauguration of Aero India 2023. This, of course, uh, at the Elhanga Air Base in Bengaluru. A stunning formation of helicopters of the Indian Air Force, the Army and the Coast Guard also took to the skies and performed some stunning aerobatics in a tri-service uh, display of strength. Another moment from the air show that left viewers awestruck was the Indian Air Force's Surakiran aerobatic team creating a heart shape in the sky, dedicating it to Aero India 2023. The U.S. Air Force's newest fifth-generation fighter, two stealthy supersonic multi-role F-35As, made their debut at the aero show today. This is the first time that an F-35 developed by the U.S. defense company Lockheed Martin is in India. 
This assumes strategic importance in the backdrop of increasing ties between India and the United States and geopolitics in the aftermath of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. At present, the F-35A is flown by about 14 air forces and navies around the world. We are getting your exclusive report from the Aero India, which is currently on here in Bengaluru. For the first time in the history of Aero India, we have the F-35, the fifth generation fighter jet, making its debut. There are two fighter jets here that have landed at the Elanka Air Force Station. It's considered to be the best fifth generation fighter jet. And remember, this is a single seat, single engine, and it's an all-weather stealth multi-role combat aircraft. This is developed by Lockheed Martin and has several features, which is the first, uh, including a cutting edge helmet mounted display system. It also has uh, its equipped for electronic warfare. It can carry out intelligence, surveillance, and also reconnaissance operations. Several reports say that uh, there are talks that have happened between India and United States for this, which is at a very, very preliminary stage, but others saying that right now, the country is focusing on ensuring the fourth generation fighters are in place so it might be pre premature to talk about acquiring f-35s for india but definitely the us which is here in large numbers perhaps the biggest contingent in the history of aero india putting up f-35 also on display making its intent clear that it wants to be a, a very crucial partner even as india looks at modernizing its uh, defense forces all these years it was the f-16 which was a major point of attraction but this time around the f-35 here really ensuring that people coming here and also for defense personnel coming here they get to see what a fifth generation fighter fly a fighter jet considered to be the best looks like meanwhile france's rafale m and the f-18 super hornet of the u.s are locked in a stiff competition to be supplying to the indian navy the manufacturers of both the aircraft claim to have satisfied the navy during technical demonstrations the Rafale M impressed the Indian Navy with its flawless maneuvering, while Boeing demonstrated the F-18 suitability for Indian aircraft carriers. They are both in the running for a suitable aircraft to be deployed on India's first indigenous aircraft carrier, the INS Vikrant. The Indian Navy is looking at buying fighter jets, especially for its INS Vikrant jets that can operate from the deck of INS Vikrant. There are two contenders for it. One is the Rafale M, the other is the F-18 Super Hornet. If you compare how both of them operate, well, Super Hornet scores over Rafale in certain aspects and Rafale does same in few other aspects. Within visual range combat, the Rafale M actually would be in a very dominant position against this Super Hornet. In almost all circumstances is what experts believe. Well, the other aspect is uh, Super Hornet is the winner of when it comes to weapon options. Although Rafale can carry a greater payload is what experts say. Well, if you look at Rafale, where it scores, Rafale is also capable of uh, super cruise. And also, it is very comfortable when it goes even at a altitude of around 30,000 feet. And when it comes to range, not much differentiating between Rafael M and the Super Hornet. Both of them, in fact, uh, are capable of mid-air refueling and have similar, similar endurance and uh, capabilities. Now, this is going to be a game changer for the Indian Army. 48 jetpack suits, which are on display at the Aero Show. These may be used along the line of actual control with China as an attempt to bolster the Indian Army's overall surveillance apparatus. The UK's Royal Navy and the US Marine Corps are already using these jetpack suits and soon we'll also be seeing our soldiers wearing these suits as part of a military modernization effort. Jet suit can make you fly. Recently, Indian Army issued one RFP regarding procurement of 48 jet suits in Indian Army. And soon after that, people were curious as to how these jet suits will be used in Indian Army and today, here in Aero India, we have got one display where you can see this jet suit by Absolute Composites Private Limited. What is the technology behind and while it is about functions, so what are the functions? I am joined by Mr. Raghav. Mr. Raghav, you tell me first of all the functionality. How we can use these jet suits because we got to know that this particular suit can make you fly? Yes, it can make you fly. You asked me two questions. One is the functionalities and the usability of it. So functionalities, 
I, uh, you know, this is powered by turbojet engines, which are fueled by diesel fuel. And uh, you have two engines on the right-hand gauntlet attached, and you have two on the left-hand side, and three engines on the rear. You know, we have a fire retardant uh, overall, and uh, heat insulated, and also fire retardant uh, boots, uh, along with the safety helmet, and uh, it would also have a, a noise cancellation uh, headphones and also a mic. A uh, person would carry somewhere in between 40 to 50 kgs based on how long he want to fly. The Indian Army is looking for such suits, 48 such suits. So what about uh, you know your part and uh, your proposal on it? See, it came as a pleasant surprise to us. We realized that you know we have to respond to it because you know we have the equipment ready with us, and we were just training the pilots because pilot training we don't get uh, trained pilots on this because this is a new equipment. And uh, we are formulating the course for training the pilots. This equipment is already 70% indigenous. It will be 80% indigenous when we supply, if at all, we get an opportunity to supply. This year's Aero India is uh, touted to be the biggest in terms of exhibits, contingents, and of course, a number of CEOs are attending. So let's break down the big numbers. A total of 809 defence companies from 98 countries are participating. Defence ministers of 32 countries are present for this year's Aero Show. The air chiefs of 29 countries are in Bengaluru for the event. 250 agreements are expected to be signed, which is likely to bring in investments in excess of 75,000 crores. It's really bold and exciting Indian vision for Make in India. India is, a, is a, already a great country, but it's only just starting. It has huge potential and we're delighted to be here and we want to be at your side. We recognize that India is in the place where it wants to build its indigenous sovereign capability so that it can export weapons and arms on its terms in India's interests because a strong India in a strong region is good for the world. Moving on here on Brass Tax, the death toll from the earthquake that struck Turkey and Syria has now crossed 35,000. But there is still hope amid all the despair. Rescuers today pulled out a 13-year-old alive from under the rubble of a collapsed building. This was in the southern province of Hatay, more than a week after the devastating earthquake struck. According to the United Nations, the phase of rescue is now coming to a close, with urgency switching to shelter, food, schooling and psychological care. The spotlight is also on accountability. 113 arrest warrants have been issued in connection with the construction of these buildings that collapsed and at least 12 people have been arrested, including contractors. CNN News 18 Siddhant Mishra has been travelling the length and breadth of Turkey to bring you the ground reality. This is his report. This is the custom gate where I am reporting from. Millions of lives have Millions of people have come on the streets after the devastating earthquake. Many have lost their lives. And in fact, this is one crucial place where we are reporting from because like this, there are three gates which have been opened by the government of Turkey so that humanitarian aid can reach Syria. And this development has taken place in last three days. We are perhaps one of the few channels reporting from Turkey-Syria border. There is one estimate that the destruction that happened in Turkey can be uh, the, 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 uh, that's, uh, uh, the, those cities, that destruction can be rebuilt in three years. But as far as Syria is concerned, it is going to take 10 years to get life back to normal. This is what reports are saying. In fact, the Russian army is also present in Syria. They are helping Bashar al-Assad government to fight war against the rebel forces. They are also carrying out the rescue works. Then UK government has funded white helmets. These are the gates through which supplies are reaching Syria. Now look at look at the truck which is passing by. Now that truck is going is taking the supplies inside the Syria. You can see this this picture these footages are relief for millions of people those who are awaiting uh, supplies 
as you see the situation of Syria and Syrian people is very bad and they are very very poor they need uh, first aid and help so the Parzan Charity Foundation came from Kurdistan and uh, sent many many supplies medical supplies relief supplies to them and uh, helping them is we helped them and we are going to help them and we carry on we keep going to Syria and help them so the trucks are coming from Kurdistan. The supplies are going Supply. to Afrin and Sheikh Hadid, Jandris, and every place that is affected from uh, earthquake. But as you see, the situation is in Syria is uh, some sensitive, and we uh, need to act sensitively. Well, now we are going to show report from a city, from a heart of a city, which has turned into mountain of debris. I'm talking about a province in Turkey known as Kerman. Maras. You can see uh, the setup has been made where food is being distributed. In fact, there are a lot of people, those who have, those who have become homeless, they are also sleeping on the roads and in fact, they are also roaming around here. This entire stretch is completely, completely devastated. It is going to take many years for this city to be rebuilt and in fact, it is going to be a very challenging job for the government here to rebuild this city of Maris, this old town of Maris. We are reporting from, from the center of the city and behind me you can see this publicity board which is not operational. It's written there, Kehraman Maras Cosmopolitan. So Kehraman Maras is one cosmopolitan city of Turkey in fact, it is a province which is completely destructed, devastated. In fact, look around, look around. Not a single building is in good condition. Half of the buildings have got collapsed. They have turned, turned into a rubble and some buildings are partially collapsed and many other buildings have suffered cracks. And this is perhaps the reason that authorities have asked people to vacate these buildings because it is not safe for them to to live in these buildings anymore so they are left to stay in adaf shelter homes i'm reporting from the scam which has been set up by government here the government's disaster management agency afad and you can see the humanitarian aid the relief material is being distributed here by many volunteers the government and in fact a lot of people uh, from different parts of the world are sending relief material to turkey and those materials are being distributed here which includes uh, water which includes food material to eat after this uh, we have also done a ground report from from a city which is few kilometers away from gazi and sep which is an epicenter. The name of the city is Antakya. And in fact, the Indian government teams, NDRF, is working on ground in Antakya. The entire city has been destructed, has been devastated. And in fact, people in this city have been asked to vacate the entire city, have been asked to vacate the entire neighborhood. Please watch this report, which has been filed by me. Antakya in Turkey is heavily devastated. We are reporting from the interiors of Antakya, building after building, complete destruction, enormous destruction that has taken place. And in fact, these areas, these neighborhoods have completely been evacuated by authorities. Nobody is living in these buildings. And in fact, there are some, some commandos from the authorities, those who have been given task here, to uh, keep law and order intact otherwise look at the destruction now this is the level of destruction and one can imagine the intensity with which the quake stuck the city of Antakya now you can see the uh, the debris on the cars parked here this is a residential locality where we are reporting from the entire multi-story building has come down has collapsed the rescue operation has got over there then there you see two vehicles two suvs have come under the debris it is going to take more than more than one year to clear all the debris 
in Antakya. Well, we are right now on Turkey-Syria border. In fact, I would like to show this for our viewers that how trucks are finally entering Syria. Look at these three trucks, which are right at the toll gates and are going to enter Syria. We are bringing this report for our viewers. These trucks are loaded with humanitarian aid and, uh, and, and medical supplies. So the formality is currently being done by the authorities here. These three trucks are lined up here. Now these three trucks uh, have been approved by the authorities and look at, look there, look there. This is how the formalities take place here at this custom gate and, uh, and the, the formalities are currently going on. Uh, this is one foundation in Turkey, which is sending help to Syria. So like this, trucks are finally being allowed and this is not one gate. In fact, there are two other gates which includes ba Bab Al Hawa and the other uh, one more gate. So in total, three gates have been opened by Turkey so that the supplies can reach Syria. Well, millions of people have been made to leave their homes and live in tents. Right now, we are reporting from Zone 4. So the entire Turkey has been divided into seven zones. We are reporting from Zone 4, which is Nur Dagi, one of the worst affected areas of this country. And in fact, people, the survivors are left to live in tents in this bitter cold children women men all are left to live in these tents which have been set up here by afad the highest body of disaster management in the country and in fact you can see the way they are cooking food right outside their tent and this is how these families have been living from last one week well going by the report of United Nations. Then before this earthquake, there were more than 4.5 million people relying on humanitarian aid. Now, after the earthquake, more 5.3 million people have been added to the list of humanitarian aid. In fact, one UN report also suggests that it is going to take almost 10 years for the government in Syria, or for that matter, the other powers controlling Syria to rebuild the country. Who has just passed out? We're showing you the visuals. She just passed out as a IPS officer. The Assam DGP got extremely emotional, his heart filled with pride at the very moment. And now moving to Uttar Pradesh, where hundreds of migratory birds actually flocked to the ghats of UP's Prayagraj town as they arrived at the Sangam. This is to provide a beautiful sight to all of those who were watching. Thousands of Siberian birds could also be seen at the Ghat. The tourists and locals rejoiced at the sight. The tourists said that watching migratory birds while taking a holy dip was very pleasing. And now to Himachal Pradesh, where the higher reaches of Kulu, Lal, Spiti, Kinnor and Shimla experienced spells of snowfall on Saturday while light rainfall lashed mid and lower hills. Tourists were thrilled to witness the fresh snowfall, particularly in Shimla's Kutti. Yeah, no, actually, first time I have first time visit Kia, but snowfall jo man dekhi, fresh snowfall abhi hoi I think aapne bhi dekhi hogi. So bahut acha raha, aur bahut acha mehsoos hua, feeling aur environment bahut acha hai yahan President Draupadi Murmu is going to be embarking on a two-day visit to Uttar Pradesh today. She'll be participating in several events, including the valedictory session of the UP Global Investor Summit 2023. This will be taking place in Lucknow. The Prime Minister inaugurated the Global Investor Summit on Friday, you remember. The President will also be gracing the 10th convocation of Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar University in Lucknow. And when it comes to the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister will be inaugurating the 246-kilometre Delhi Dosa Lalsab stretch of the Delhi Mumbai Expressway. Now, why this is key is because what the stretch does is it reduces the travel time from Jaipur to the national capital. Right now, it takes about five hours. It'll be cut down to about three, three and a half hours. 
first leg of the Delhi Mumbai Expressway is all set to be thrown open to public by Prime Minister Narin Modi from Rajasthan's Dosa. Now we are correctly reporting from that particular stretch. Now this is the stretch of 246 km long which is of the Delhi Dosa Lal Sort made at a cost of 12,150 crore. Now correctly it takes 5 hours to reach from Delhi to Jaipur but now after the inauguration of the same expressway it is going to take the same distance to be covered in 3.5 hours. The Prime Minister will be visiting polebound Karnataka on Feb 13 to inaugurate the 14th edition of Aero India 2023. This is at the Air Force Station in the capital. Now, uh, the 14th edition will include aerial displays by aircrafts along with a large exhibition and a trade of aerospace companies. Also in Karnataka, yesterday, the Union Home Minister Amit Shah was visiting, launched a scathing attack against the Congress. He said that it strengthens anti-national elements and can never protect the state. The Congress has obviously rebutted that. Uh, he argued that the Congress has released 1,700 members of the Popular Front of India. You remember, that's the group that uh, the central government banned a few months ago. Now, we'll tell you more about what was said. This was all yesterday in Karnataka. Moving now to Chhattisgarh, where after a long visit to the pole-bound state, the BJP National President J.P. Nadda will be visiting West Bengal today. The BJP President will address two gatherings. He'll also help organise meetings as a part of measures to strengthen the Saffron Party's hopes within West Bengal, where they have stiff competition from the TMC. And now to some important appointments. President Draupadi Murmu has accepted the resignation of the Maharashtra Governor Bhagat Singh Koshyari. Remember, he had a very long, full of uh, controversy tenure all the way back since 2019. Koshyari, as we just told you, served for the state for over three years. He's being replaced by the current Governor of Jharkhand, Ramesh Best. And now, let's back to the national capital where an anti-encroachment drive continues in Nairobi amid protests by locals. Yesterday, the Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal actually came out. He asked the DDA, the Delhi Development Authority, to stop its anti-encroachment drive. He also announced a fresh demarcation exercise in the area. And the MCD attempts again and again to have Mayor Pauls, the Lieutenant Governor right here in Delhi, Vinal Saxena, has issued and announced 16th February is going to be the fresh date for these mayoral polls. You'll remember the Delhi government has attempted a few times now to have the mayoral polls go smoothly. They have so far failed. And former Bihar Chief Minister Lalu Prasad Yadav returned to the national capital on Saturday after undergoing a successful kidney transplant surgery in, Sydney, in Singapore. This was in December over the past year. The RJD president was unwell. He was under treatment. Earlier, his daughter, who had donated the kidney to her father, actually shared an emotional post on Twitter about his recovery journey. And now to other stories. We're taking you to Vishakhapatnam, where at least nine people were injured in a mishap. This is at the Vizag steel plant in Andhra Pradesh. Now, the explosion occurred in a conveyor belt, which was carrying liquid steel in the plant. Four plant employees and five contract workers were among those who were injured. Meanwhile, the trade union leaders demanded an investigation into the entire incident. And now in Uttar Pradesh, where a fire broke out in Kanpur, in a part of Kanpur in Uttar Pradesh. The fire destroyed eight vehicles parked in police custody. Local police reached the spot. They brought the fire under control with the help of the fire department. But the cause of the fire is as of yet unknown. बर्रा थाना के अंतर्गत पड़ने वाली एक पुरानी चौकी बर्रा चौकी जो वर्तमान में जहां पर सरकारी कार्य नहीं होता है पर आग लगने की सूचना मिली सूचना मिलते ही स्थानीय पुलिस मौके पर पहुंची और फायर सर्विसेज की मदद से आग पर काबू पा लिया गया किसी तरह की जनहानि वहां नहीं हुई है और आग किस वजह से लगी इसकी जांच की जा रही है All right, and a hand grenade was found lying near a canal in Ganga Nahari, which is a rural area of Uttar Pradesh's Meerut. Now, the grenade was disposed of by a local team of people along with a bomb squad. A preliminary inquiry has been ordered after seizing the hand grenade. 
And now to Tamil Nadu, where the Governor R. N. Ravi participated in a graduation ceremony at a private college in Coimbatore yesterday. Ravi addressed the students after awarding them degrees at the ceremony. He said India is the fastest growing economy in the world. You'll remember that his tenure has also faced quite a bit of controversy in conflict. Namaskar, this is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. Hope you had a good weekend. If you're in the US, I'm sure reality was competing with fiction. The Pentagon is talking about aliens. The balloon wars have intensified. And while the Americans figure out what's in their skies, the Chinese are amping up their nuclear arsenal. China wants to triple it. In Pakistan, there's talk of Imran Khan planning to sue General Bajwa, the former army chief. In Turkey, the president is facing flak for poor response and he's going after the builders. And in Japan, the aging society is being offered some outrageous solutions.